Yeah, what's this big deal about colorectal cancer? Well, one, it's a preventable cancer. Okay, many cancers we find when they're there. This is a cancer that we can prevent. That's really important. <clears throat> it's the third most common cancer in the United States next to lung cancer and uh, breast cancer, but it's the number two cancer killer in the United States. It's curable if it's detected early and it can be avoided if it's prevented. So I want you to concentrate on these words, detection and prevented. It's going to be a theme as we go through here. <coughs> um, for some reason, people think it's more common in men than it is in women, probably because of the rectal exam when we examine men's prostate, but it's roughly, it roughly equally occurs in men and women. It's most common after 50 years of age. It can affect some people younger than 50 years of age. We've seen that here in Wilson. Um, <coughs> and the risk increases uh, with age. Now, what are some definitions? We talk about screening, surveillance. We throw these terms around like they're interchangeable, and they're really not. Screening is what we do for average risk individuals, somebody who doesn't have a higher risk of colon cancer than the next person. Surveillance is what we do for people who are at higher risk. Who's at higher risk? We'll talk about that here in a minute. But if you had a precancerous polyp, you're at higher risk. So you're no longer in the screening program, you're in the surveillance program. And the difference is the intervals with which we'll do colon, we'll recommend colonoscopy. <clears throat> but a couple years ago, the American College of Gastroenterology started to concentrate on detection and prevention. Now, detection finds the cancer when it's there. Prevention prevents it from occurring. Stops colorectal cancer before it occurs. <coughs> now, who's average risk? <clears throat> Non-African Americans of 50 years of age or older with no prior history of colorectal cancer or precancerous polyps. <coughs> No significant family history of colon cancer, and it's not, it depends who in the family and what age they are as far as whether it puts you at higher risk for colon cancer, which puts you in the surveillance program, which is, which is a, a more frequent colonoscopy schedule. So which relatives are affected, their age and their diagnosis, it's important when we try to assess risk. And that's what we do in the office when we see people before colonoscopy, we try to assess their risk. <coughs> Two, um, two inflammatory bowel diseases, ulcerative colitis and, and Crohn's, when it affects the colon, places you at higher risk depending upon how long you had the colitis. And that's a special, uh, a special circumstance as far as how frequently those people will get colonoscopy. Now, who's high risk? If you've had a precancerous polyp, if you have a strong family history of colon cancer, and who matters? Does grandma at 90 years old matter? No, it really doesn't. <clears throat> and we'll talk about that here in a second. There are, there are inherited forms of colon cancer. We'll talk about that also. And then the predisposing GI diseases that I talked about. Now, what are the symptoms? Now, most of these cancers have no symptoms until the cancer spreads. Once, once cancer spreads, it's uh, incurable. Once it spreads outside the organ of origin. So if colon cancer comes to attention after it spreads to the liver, that's a big deal. And that's it's managed in a little different way than we would if the colon cancer was localized in the colon. Some of these cancers can be localized there for, for years, two to three years, and still be curable. Now because colon cancer produces no symptoms, this is why screening is important, because we can find cancers in asymptomatic people, and we can prevent them from dying from colon cancer. <clears throat> if we remove these polyps, these precursors of most colon cancers, we can prevent death from colon cancer. <clears throat> most, I tell patients, most polyps never grow into cancer. We just can't tell which ones will and which ones won't when we're in there with the scope. So we remove them all. And the reason why we do that is that the studies, like long studies now, 25 years old, uh, have shown that if we remove polyps from people as a group, they generally die of colon cancer at a much, much lower rate than people who don't have their polyps removed. That's the basis of colonoscopy being a preventative tool. <coughs> now, what are the symptoms? And these are pretty general symptoms, and they don't necessarily mean you have colon cancer if you have these symptoms. <coughs> a new onset of abdominal pain, blood in the stool, or a change in the stool caliber or shape. <coughs> Most importantly, a change in your typical bowel habits, which can be due to a new medication that your cardiologist gave you. Um, can be a change in your diet, can be due to colon cancer, diarrhea, constipation. There's no one specific symptom that tells me you have colon, that you could have colon cancer. 
<coughs> again, the key is the new onset of these symptoms should prompt a visit to your physician. Now, what's colonoscopy? That dreaded word. <coughs> it's really a careful examination of the large intestine. That's the colon. That's the end of the, the intestine. With a lighted, flexible, not rigid, flexible uh, electronic instrument called a colonoscope. <coughs> and allows uh, gastroenterologists, colorectal surgeons, people who are trained to do this, to look inside the entire colon and check for issues. You know that most colonoscopies in the United States are done by people who are not trained to do it? Never had formal training. My training was two years. That training now is three years. Um, so I went to four years of medical school, three years of internal medicine residency, and two years of GI fellowship. And the GI fellowship is three years. I tell them it's because they're not as smart as we were, but <laughs> a little bit more to learn. But most colonoscopies done in the United States, when you look at the coding data at Medicare, are done by non-specialty trained physicians. So as a physician, I can do brain surgery in my garage. You probably wouldn't want me to do that for you, but I have a license to kill. So I pick up uh, something and do it. I mean, I'd be able to do it more than once, but I'll do it. So it's important to find somebody who does this and who's fairly well trained in doing it. Remember the first year when I finished my fellowship, I thought I was great. And after a year, I looked back and I said, boy, I wish it wasn't as good as I thought I was. And then a year later, I said, well, you know, I started reading the notes that I wrote last year. I said, wow, I look pretty dumb. Probably took me about eight years um, to really, really, really realize where I was when I was in training and when I was out of training and, you know, where I finally got to. And someone told me, as my name was up, it was an Air Force guy. And he tells me how, how fighter pilots become part of the plane. That their training makes them part of the plane. The guys that don't get shot down are the ones that are really part of the plane. And I realized what that meant, what, what he meant by that at about my 10th year out of training is that you sort of become part of the instrument. Sometimes I tell people I can do this exam with my eyes closed, but I'm just trying to relax things for them. But you really want to go to somebody who's well trained. <coughs> Over the last uh, 20 years, it's the preferred method to screen people for abnormal precancerous growths, these polyps. <coughs> it's probably one of the most powerful tools we have in medicine as far as saving lives. And it has the potential to identify and remove these precancerous growths, which we're going to get to in a second. Now, when we talk about prevention and detection, the preferred test to prevent colon cancer is colonoscopy, unequivocal, no questions asked. And you probably will have some questions about that as we go through this as to why the other tests don't prevent cancer. I'll try to answer them for you. And it prevents cancer because there's a progression from these precancerous polyps over a three to five year period to cancer. So it stands to reason that if we set our intervals right based upon the arithmetic, we can not do too many colonoscopies, take out the precancerous growths before they grow into colon cancer. That's a polyp. <coughs> That's the head of the body. This is the wall of the colon. You're looking inside the colon. This is the wall of the colon. These are normal blood vessels. This is the tunnel probably going upstream a little bit. This right here is a stalk. So this stalk polyp. It's like a mushroom, this one here. Some of these polyps are not on stalks. Stalks ones are easier to take out. Some of them are just a big chunk that insinuates itself into the wall of the colon. They're called sessile polyps. That's a good example of a pre That's pretty much a precancerous polyp. Probably not a cancer. And even this polyp. Let's say if this polyp were to progress to cancer, where there were cancer cells in the top of the polyp here, uh, not invading the stalk. Just taking out this cancerous polyp would be enough. You don't need surgery. In some places, those would sell it, send these people to surgery. But we have criteria where we can take out a polyp, even a big polyp, a two, three centimeter polyp, and if it meets certain criteria, that's all that needs to be done. We don't need to chop out your colon. We don't need to give you a colostomy. We don't need to do anything like that. And that's the reason to go to somebody who's well trained in this, so they can interpret the pathology. The pathologist tells me when I submit a biopsy what they see, but they don't tell me what to do with it. That's my job. <coughs> About 90% or more of colon. <coughs> yeah, 
Hey, you're gonna come to me as a call ask you this time. And not break the clicker. <laughs> Now, more than 90% of, of, of cancers can be avoided through early detection. <clears throat> now, last year, almost, almost 51,000 people died of colon cancer. When we do the arithmetic, half of, their, half of those people could have had their lives saved had they gone for their screening colonoscopy. That's a powerful, that's 25,000 people. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of morbidity and that's a lot of, a lot of pain and suffering. Half of them could have been saved. So prevention versus detection of colorectal cancer. The American College of Gastroenterology, that's the group that I took my certification board from, um, they divide the options uh, into cancer prevention tests and cancer detection tests. <clears throat> Obviously preventing cancer is preferred over detecting cancer once it occurs. What do we do and how often do we do it? <clears throat> in an average risk person, colonoscopy every 10 years is the preferred colorectal cancer prevention test for individuals who have an average risk of colon cancer. No family history, no prior polyps, no inflammatory bowel disease, um, none of the things that we're concerned about. <clears throat> in 2009, the American, 2011 American College of Gastroenterology identified African Americans as a higher risk group. Now there are three GI societies, the American Gastroenterological Association, American College of Gastroenterology, <coughs> and the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. And then the feds, the feds make the decisions. But I go by what my society recommends. And the American College of Gastroenterology is the only one of the three societies that recommends screening to begin in African Americans of average risk of 45 years of age. We don't know, it, it, it appears that colon cancer in African Americans is maybe more aggressive, may occur at an earlier age, and, and um, may kill people faster. We're not quite sure why that is. We're not quite sure if it's a genetic issue, if it's a social issue that people don't go to the doctor, don't go, to, don't go for their colon cancer screening. We're not quite sure, but that recommendation we've been, I've been using now for the last, um, since I've been here in Wilson. <coughs> Now, there are some alternative colorectal cancer prevention tests. There's the flexible sigmoidoscopy, which is a short version of a colonoscopy. And many of you old enough may re remember that we used to do that test in the office without sedation. Um, and we used to couple it with tests for fecal occult blood. The rationale being that most cancers occurred in the left side within reach of this 50 centimeter instrument. And if you had a cancer and we found occult blood, we could then send you to colonoscopy and bypass the sigmoidoscopy. Well, it turns out more than 50% of the cancers are beyond the reach of a flexible sigmoidoscope, and about 30% of the cancers on the right side of the colon don't bleed, so the fecal occult blood test is negative. But if you're practicing medicine in Alaska, where one of my residents went, who called me up and wanted to learn colonoscopy over Christmas, and I said no. Um, this may be the only test that you have, depending upon your community. And it's, if this is the only test you have, this is what you use. Now, detection. We're looking, we're looking to find cancer when it occurs. And what we can do is that we can, we can test for blood in the stool. We can even focus that a little bit more by using an immunochemical test that tests for actual molecules of hemoglobin that may arise from the cancer. Many cancers will shed blood because they overgrow their blood supply and they ulcerate and they bleed a little bit. Not enough for you to see, but enough for us to test with a very, very sensitive test. But again, it's there to detect cancer when cancer occurs. It's a relatively new test that not everybody does. I think Dr. Woodard was doing them, right? Was, was he doing these in the office? I think I saw them when I came and then they were taken out of the office, the, the sticks. <coughs> Now, what about, what about CT colonography, virtual colonoscopy? I'm sure you've all heard about that and probably have questions about that. <clears throat> so an alternative cancer detection test, detection, again, detecting cancer, not preventing cancer. 
is a CT exam uh, every five years. How that exam is done is that um, it's done without sedation, so that's one good thing about it. Um, one not so good thing about it is that they fill you up with water from below so that they can get contrast with the x-rays. And, um, and then they do a, C, a fast CT scan and then reconstruct the image to see if they can see the inside of the colon. It looks really cool. It's, it's really impressive what the, what the computer can do to reconstruct um, the x-ray images. <coughs> the problem is, is that uh, anything, any polyp less than six, six millimeters, okay, six millimeters, an inch is 2.5 centimeters, so six millimeters, 25 millimeters is an inch, so about a quarter of an inch. <coughs> any thing that may look like a polyp, again, you're just really looking at shadows, you're not actually looking in the colon like we are with the colonoscopy, is reported as negative. So they don't report polyps smaller than six centimeters. That is a polyp that could be halfway on its way to growing into a precancerous polyp that could put you at risk. Which is the reason why we recommend it every five years. It's expensive. It probably costs more than a, probably costs a lot more than a colonoscopy. Now, if you get an X-ray and they find a polyp, guess what? You need a colonoscopy. <laughs> so you can run, but you can't hide. And that's probably the, the one thing that's bad about this. Now, it's very useful, and we've done them in our practice. Um, sometimes we can't get the scope in. Very rarely. There's a lot of scar tissue, uh, especially women who've had hysterectomy, cesarean sections. Sometimes there's so much scar tissue that we really can't get around safely. And um, uh, then the x-ray would be helpful to look up above the area where we weren't able to get it. And if we find something there, then we have to figure out what to do. Now the alternative cancer detection test would be um, either fecal DNA testing that tests for the DNA from the tumors uh, or the standard chemical test that you may be all familiar with. That's where we take a little glob of stool, put it on a piece of paper that's got some chemical in it, we put another chemical on it and see if it turns color, which indicates that there's blood. It doesn't tell you where the blood's coming from, it just tells you that there's blood. <coughs> like we said, African Americans should begin um, screening earlier. It's the preferred method of screening for colorectal cancer in all ethnic groups. African Americans are the only ones that we begin screening in earlier, of African Americans of average risk. They tend to have a higher prevalence of tumors on the right side of the colon, <coughs> and as a group have a higher incidence of colorectal cancer. Questions? Yes? What's the difference between having a right side or a left side tumor? What's the difference? Well, you you mentioned the right side tumor, but why? <coughs> Why does that occur? And what's the difference between having one on the right side or the left side of the... Of the a cancer, not much difference. There is a difference to us as far as taking it out because uh, the wall on the right side of the colon is a little bit thinner. Um, right side of colon cancers, as the, and I'll show you a picture of the, of the colon here in a minute. As, as the products of digestion go through the small intestine, it's all liquid. It gets into the large intestine. It's still liquid. And it will go up the ascending colon, which is the right side, go across the transverse colon, and it's not until it's in the left side of the colon does it become sort of solid. So you've got to grow a pretty big cancer on the right side for it to obstruct the intestine and give you symptoms. A cancer on the left side may come to attention a little bit earlier because the stool there is narrow, so you're put, putting a, a big bolus of stool through a little narrow opening, whereas over here, it's liquid. And you may not have any symptoms in it. The opening may be only two millimeters. And, and that's a big circumferential cancer. And the lumen is, rather than be like this, the lumen is a pinhole, but you may not have any symptoms. So the right side of cancers are a little bit more silent. And <clears throat> right side of colon cancers, although most colon cancers, many colon cancers can be found by testing for a fecal occult blood, it's fairly, t it's fairly well recognized that right-sided colon cancers can be present and your fecal occult blood test can be negative. Even three done three days in a row. 
So there's always, in, me in medicine, there's always a trap. <coughs> it's never, ever kind of trap. <coughs> So the most important thing to me as far as doing colonoscopy is how well the bowel is prepared. Because if I can't see, I can't really do you much good. I can't tell you that you definitely don't have anything there that we need to worry about. So the bowel preparation is really, really important. And it's gained a lot of importance in the last five or six years. I like to say everybody caught up with me, which is really true. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. <coughs> the cleanest colon gives the best results. And no, I can't clean it out from the inside. So you only drink half the prep. Don't think you're gonna come in and snooker me and say, oh yeah, I drank everything because I'm gonna go up there and we're not gonna get a good exam. All right, it can't, it, even though it, it's sort of counterintuitive, no, I can't wash out the stool as well from below as you can from above. <coughs> now, the patients claim that the preparation is the toughest part of the exam, but things have changed. As I said, a good, a good prep is essential. <coughs> and how has the rest of the world caught up with me? I was a fellow and I had rectal bleeding and I needed a sigmoidoscopy and I decided I, will, I would try the gallon and go lightly. I was probably 32, 33 years old. For sigmoidoscopy, we just use enemas to prep. And I said, well, let me see what my patients are complaining about. It's terrible. <laughs> I mean, that last, that last, Half a quart was just tough. <laughs> but what was really important, as I saw when I was in training, is that patients would drink this gallon the night before, and their colon still wasn't clean. They would come in in the morning, there would be all this bile that would stain. The bile is very, very tenacious. It sticks to the wall and has, it can't be washed off. <clears throat> so when I went into practice, I started splitting the dose. I started giving people half of it the night before and half of it the morning of. That was 1987. Well, it turns out that that really does give the best prep. And everybody wondered about my preps, but this was never on the radar. This only came on the radar about six or seven years ago. Really about five years ago, it became nationwide. So we learned that taking one half of the preparation the night before, and then the remainder to finish about two to three hours before the colonoscopy starts, gives you an absolutely pristine preparation. Okay, it's cleaner than the inside of of some people's mouths. It's really absolutely pristine. There's no stool. I can take my time and examine rather than <coughs> wash stuff away. <coughs> now, what about discomfort during the procedure? <coughs> we give medication intravenously to provide relaxation, analgesia, and the combination of the medications that we use in the endoscopy suite gives you amnesia. So most people, it's not uncommon people will wake up and say, when do we start? And we're already done. It's not uncommon for people to be wide awake after the procedure and I talk to them and explain to them their results and they complain that I, they never saw me, even though their spouse is with them and said, yes, don't you remember he was talking with you? So the amnesia can be pretty profound, which is the reason why we tell you don't, you're not gonna do anything for the remainder of the day. You're not gonna go home and sell stock the way I did after my colonoscopy. <laughs> Trust me, you should not do that. Sell stock. Big mistake. I figured, you know, July, January, th uh, December 31st, I'll get in under the wire, a mistake. I didn't even remember I did it. So uh, what I use in the uh, endoscopy suite is something called fentanyl, which is a narcotic, and midazolam, which is a short-acting Valium. The relaxation increases the safety of the exam because we're not fighting each other. It gives you analgesia, so because colonoscopy sometimes is uncomfortable. No doubt about it. It's uncomfortable because we, as we're putting in the scope, we, this, the, the colon's collapsed. In order for me to see where we're going, we have to blow in some air. Air stretches the colon. The only kind of sensation that the colon can really feel is the sensation of stretch. When you get abdominal cramps, it's because your intestine's being distended and stretched. And I'm blowing you up with air. <laughs> like I said, sometimes it's uncomfortable. Not all people's colons are the same. Not, not every exam, oh, no exam, no two exams are identical. There's always something a little bit different. This is not me doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. Every person is treated as an individual. Every person has some different characteristics on the outside and the inside. <laughs> the amnesia is probably the best thing because again, it is sometimes a little bit uncomfortable and it's nice for you to not remember the discomfort. 
<laughs> now, there's another way of doing sedation. There, there's, there's, um, there's a medication called propofol, and this takes you beyond the stage of sedation analgesia. The next stage after deep sedation is anesthesia. Anesthesia is when your muscles, your breathing, breathing muscles don't work and you need cardiovascular support by the anesthesiologist and you need somebody to help you breathe with a breathing tube. So if I'm using if I'm using the, the sedation analgesia, the next step is deep sedation. You still got your breathing reflexes. You still have your um, gag reflex. Uh, I can take you back from that. If we overdo it with propofol, the next step is you're going to stop breathing and we're going to need to resuscitate you. But that's sort of been worked out. That, uh, I don't want to sound like this is a dangerous type of sedation. It's not. It's a very, very good sedation. Um, you're in and out. Um, there's almost no recovery period after the propofol wears off. The problem with propofol, which if you know this by um, a brand name, which is Diperman, Dipper, well, it's the Michael Jackson drug. This is what did Michael Jackson in. And that's because there's a very, very, very fine line between just enough and too much. And the too much means you stop breathing. <clears throat> when you stop breathing, we just support your ventilation. We don't need to put a... Uh, to put a breathing tube in, we could use a, a ball valve mask and breathe for you until this medication gets gets metabolized and gets inactivated, which will be a short period of time. <clears throat> the problem with propofol, in my opinion, is that one, um, you need an anesthesiologist or, or a nurse anesthetist to administer it. <clears throat> the cost for the anesthesia professional is often more than the cost for the colonoscopist, which increases the cost of the procedure tremendously. And some insurance companies do not, in New York, they didn't pay for this unless you had an absolute reason that we had to, uh, that we had a document, a uh, developmentally disabled person who needed a procedure. Um, <coughs> and we use this here, some of the gastroenterologists here, uh, Dr. Latchman uses this here in, in Wilson. I use it, but I use it in the operating room where we have the anesthesiologist. Oops. <clears throat> so this is not as gruesome as it seems. Um, as a matter of fact, it's, um, it's fairly sedate, especially when the patient's sedate. Um, usually it takes about 15 to 20 minutes to do the entire exam. Sometimes it takes a lot longer. Sometimes, like I said, but not all colons are the same. <clears throat> the colonoscope transmits an image of the colon into a video screen that we can see in the room, and we can remove polyps by using tools, biopsy forceps, snares, different tools that we can put through a working channel that's in the, the shaft of the scope. We can actually work with him in the scope. So we can do, um, we, we can prevent colon cancer in a single procedure. Between the time you come into the endoscopy unit, get prepared by the nurses, they take the history, you go into the endoscopy room, it takes about a half hour to do the test, it takes about another hour of recovery, so figure you're going to be about two to three hours there. You're going to be there less time early in the morning than you are later in the morning because some of the early morning cases may go a lot longer than we expected because we had unexpected findings. And rather than have the patient come back and do this all over again, my feeling is that we do it then, and I'm sorry if people are late and they complain, but you know, we're all in this together. <coughs> Complications are rare. Bleeding occurs in about one in a thousand people that we take polyps out of. Usually not when we take the polyp out, but as the area heals, sometimes the scab can fall off and you can bleed. Sometimes you can bleed so much you have to come back to the hospital, sometimes get blood transfusions. Sometimes you have to go back up there with the scope and cauterize the area. It happens extremely rarely, more than a thousand. With, with the newer techniques and doing things a little bit differently than we did five years ago, the bleeding rate has gone down significantly. <coughs> infection is an issue. Infection in the sense that if we do damage to the colon wall or if we perforate the colon, that's, there's an infection. There's, at this hospital, there's almost zero risk of infection with the scopes, which go through a sterilizer. And I've actually snuck behind the people who clean them just to make sure that I'm comfortable with the way things are being cleaned and they do it all, they do it right here. You may hear about the horror stories at Tennessee VA and a couple of other places, uh, Las Vegas, big deal. 
uh, where they just weren't cleaning the scopes the way the manufacturer said to. So, too much of the drugs is not a good thing because, again, you have a reaction, you don't wake up, your breathing stops, you have to call cardiac arrest. It's never happened to me, but it's happened to other people. Rupture of the spleen. How in the world are we going to rupture the spleen? The spleen's nowhere near the colon. Actually, it's on the outside of the colon underneath the left rib cage. And there's a little attachment between the spleen and the colon that develops. And so most of us have a fairly long attachment so that when we go and make this left hand turn and go around the side and go over here, um, we don't put too much tension on the spleen. About 1 in 50,000 people are born with a congenitally short ligament. And when we make that turn, we torque it and the spleen splits. Again, 1 in 50,000 figure what? 50,000 people in Wilson? That's how rare that is. It requires emergency surgery to have your spleen out. Easiest colonoscopy I ever did I had a ruptured spleen. As a matter of fact, I felt guilty because I did the exam like twice and time it would take me to do it once and there was no problem whatsoever. <coughs> and this lady uh, calls me up the next day and said she had a little bit of belly ache and it didn't sound like much. I did it on a Friday, she called me on Saturday. <coughs> decided that she wouldn't eat for the rest of the day. She called me back, she said I feel better. Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon at around 1.30, I got a call from her daughter that she's collapsed in the living room and take her to the hospital. I go into the operating room and the surgeon's got one half of the spleen in one hand and the other half of the spleen in the other hand. So it happens even when you don't expect it. Um, colon perforation, that's where we actually poke a hole in the colon. That's a, that's a big deal. Uh, it usually leads to an infection unless it's fixed usually immediately and if you have your colon really well cleaned you can get this fixed without having to have a colostomy but if there's a lot of stool in the colon and you have a perforation the surgeon's going to have to give you a temporary colostomy bag where the waste comes out into a bag for about four weeks and then we'll repair that with another operation the reason for the colostomy is is when you put two areas of the intestine together that are infected they fall apart that's a nightmare that's three weeks in the hospital and a big deal <coughs> Perforation rate's about 1 in 1,700. I've done about 45,000 colonoscopies. I've had one splenic rupture and three perforations. Now, the most important thing is that as a patient, you really got to speak up. You got to ask questions. You got to be a New Yorker. People here don't ask questions <laughs> of their doctors. You, you just can't sit back and and, and think everything's gonna go okay. You really gotta talk to your doctor, and if you're uncomfortable, you gotta let the doctor know that you want your questions answered. If you don't understand what anybody's doing to you or why it's being done, speak up. That's why you're paying <coughs> us to do this. It's extremely important. That's a big deal. It's expensive, it exposes you to risk. If you get a colonoscopy that you don't need, if you get a colonoscopy too late, that could also be a problem, obvious problem. So one of our jobs is to make sure that we give you the right information. And this has all been worked out over the last couple of years. <clears throat> so if you, have a, if you have a colonoscopy and it's normal, no polyps, you have no other risks, nobody else in the family, your next colonoscopy is 10 years. Now you say, well, I may get colon cancer in 10 years. But this, yes, you may. But the statistics show that if you develop colonoscopy in 10 years on this plan, the colon cancer will be in a curable stage, curable in the sense that we can cut out a segment of the colon, put you back together again, and you can go on and live your life. Now, if you have one of these precancerous adenomas and it's over a centimeter in size, your next colonoscopy is in three years. A, when we look at things under the microscope, we can tell different types of adenomas. And if you have a, a villus, pattern on the, in, the, in the pathology of any size, centimeter, greater than a centimeter, less than a centimeter, your next colonoscopy is three years. If you have three or more adenomas of any size, your next colonoscopy is three years. Now here's the controversy. When you have two or fewer adenomas less than a centimeter in size, the statistics say you probably can go 10 years, but some political pressure made them make the recommendations five to 10 years. So we'll leave it up to the doctor and the patient. And a lot of things may factor into that. You may not have had a perfect preparation. Um, doctor may not have got as good a look as he wanted to. 
and you make them say, we'll do it in five years. <laughs> now, there are other kinds of polyps. These are the non-precancerous polyps. Under the microscope, they're called hyperplastic polyps. They have no pre-malignant potential when they occur in small numbers, small numbers being less than, less than six. If you have hyperplastic polyps, even though you have a polyp, not, it doesn't increase, this type of polyp doesn't increase your risk for colon cancer, so the next colonoscopy is 10 years. But just because your doctor told you you had a polyp and you need to come back in three years, five years, you really need to know what kind of polyp that is. a family history of colon cancer matter? Does grandma at 90 years of age, is the only person in your family with colon cancer, increase your risk for getting colon cancer? And do you need to be screened more frequently? <clears throat> a first degree relative is a parent, sibling, and a child. The thing, that's, the thing that's notable about them is that they have half your genes. So if you have a single first degree relative who develops colorectal cancer or an adenoma younger than 60 years of age, the recommendation is for colonoscopy every five years, no matter what we find during your colonoscopy. There's a little, now you're out of the screening, you're in the surveillance, you're a little higher risk group here. <coughs> now before we talked about adenomas being less than a centimeter, you go every five to 10 years. <coughs> So if you have a personal history of an adenoma of any size, over a centimeter, less than a centimeter, and you have a history of a first degree relative with colon cancer or precancerous colon polyp of any age, not over 60, no than 60, then you're in another group, then you're still going every five years. This is not as simple as it all appears, but it's worked out. Now there are, are some other issues that as a, as a gastroenterologist um, uh, I need to be particularly concerned about. One of them are these cancer, colon cancer syndromes, which in New York, if I saw two or three a year, I would be astounded. Here I see two or three a month. So it must be the gene pool, because these are genetically linked cancers. And there's something called Lynch syndrome where we have three or more first degree relatives with colon cancer or colon polyps and who have cancers of other organs. And the other related organs are the ovary, the uterus, the kidney, the small intestine, gallbladder, you can read that. Especially basal cell skin cancer, which is not something that most doctors think about. We sort of blow off basal cell skin cancer because it's, you know, nobody dies of basal cell skin cancer. Very, very rarely does it metastasize. It's usually taken care of by the dermatologist. But believe it or not, basal cell skin cancer, not squamous cell skin cancer, but basal cell skin, the defect in basal cell skin cancer is the same as the defect in these genetically determined colon cancer syndromes that causes the colon to develop cancer. And then there's a condition called familial adenomatous polyposis, which is the development of thousands of polyps uh, usually in childhood, um, usually presents with rectal bleeding in children. Um, we usually don't, don't do colonoscopy. We'll, we'll take a look in and look at the very end. We'll see what it is and then we'll do a full colonoscopy when they're 18 after they go through uh, their teenage years and they all need to have their colon out usually before 25 or earlier. Otherwise they will develop colon cancer. And that's a genetically linked syndrome that we can identify. Now both of these syndromes are, are, are passed, with, uh, passed from generation to generation by what's called a, a dominant gene. In other words, you only need one gene to express this picture, which means that every pregnancy, if this, if this gene is in the mother or the father, every pregnancy will have a, every child will have a 50% chance of carrying this gene and expressing the disease. With with the Lynch syndrome, not the familial adenomas polyposis, it usually it doesn't come to attention until adulthood. Sometimes early adulthood, sometimes in the 20s. Uh, a history of ovarian, of uterine cancer in a 29-year-old should raise everybody's eyebrows. Uh, 
Well, that's a big deal. Urinary cancer doesn't occur in young people unless it's associated with this syndrome. Now, this is a big deal in Wilson. All right, so you had your colonoscopy, and I tell you your average risk. You don't need to come back for 10 years. 18 months later, you come back to the office and you say, my doctor did one of those hemocol tests in the office and it's got blood in it. If you're me, what are you gonna do? You got the lawyers with the gun here. You got the federal, you got the state with the gun here. You know that we miss things, there's a miss rate. We miss polyps, we miss cancer, very rarely, but we miss them. So what are we gonna do? We got blood in the stool, we got a normal colonoscopy 18 months ago. I'm gonna tell you to do a normal colonoscopy. I'd be crazy not to. I know I missed things. I'm a humble guy. So we don't really recommend annual fecal occult testing, especially done in the doctor's office during your physical examination, where there's trauma with the finger when they examine the prostate gland, or after uh, a uh, gynecological exam, where, it, where after, the, after the doctor scrapes the cervix to do the pap smear and then uses the same glove to examine the rectum and then smear the stool, the stool, uh, the stool card, it's going to be positive. So if you believe in the intervals, if you believe in the 10-year intervals, annual fecal occult blood testing is not part of that. And I've got some papers back there from our GI societies that will explain that to you. You could make the argument since polyps, for the most part, may take three to five years to grow into colon cancer. That's the old line. It may take a lot longer than that. But even if you believe three to five year interval between an adenoma and a cancer, you could make the argument for doing fecal occult blood testing in somebody who's in that 10-year screening interval starting at year six. You could make that argument. And I can accept that, but not, not a year after your exam. Unless, and then people say, well, what if the exam was poor? If the exam was poor, it needs to be repeated in a year. An a poorly prepared colon that we do for colon cancer screening, if it's not well prepared, recommendations are to do the examination in a year. Not 10 years, not five years, not three years, but one year. <coughs> The other dirty little secret about these hemocol cards is that they they can be falsely positive about 30% of the time. So they'll detect blood that's not from a cancer. So we do the colonoscopy and there's no cancer there. Now what are we gonna do? Do you have an ulcer? Do you have a stomach cancer? Should we be looking for blood elsewhere? So we just start going on this wild goose chase. That's costly and it's inconvenient. Support. Generally, the more testing may not be the best thing all the time. <coughs> Questions? Yeah. Now comes the inside baseball. Right, all colons are not the same. And all colonoscopies are not the same. And all colonoscopies are not the same. Despite what we like to believe. We started asking about 10 or 15 years ago, and as a matter of fact, I sat on an AS, uh, uh, American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy National Committee where we started working on this. How can we measure quality in colonoscopy? I told you before that most people do colonoscopy and never been trained to do it. It doesn't protect the public very much. You don't know. You think somebody gave them a license to do this, but they really didn't. They just gave them a license to kill, like I said before. <coughs> so how can we determine whether the doctor's doing what the doctor's supposed to do, according to consensus guidelines from national experts. <clears throat> well, we came up with six, six things that we could measure consistently from doc to doc. One is in screening colonoscopy, that's someone of average risk, that's someone coming back to have a colonoscopy after they already had a polyp taken out. <clears throat> but someone who going for screening colonoscopy, how many adenomas are found? Because that's, that's really where the money is, is finding the adenomas preventing the cancer, right? So you say well, it's all the same. <coughs> this all started in a study of a big, very, very good practice in Rockford, Illinois, seven or eight gastroenterologists, all university trained, and the adenoma detection rate ranged from about 30% to about 6% all in the same practice. No difference in the patients. 
These are all patients who just came in for screening colonoscopy, not patients who had been in the practice. So that sort of raised everybody's eyebrows, is how could this guy who we all thought was great have an adenoma rate of 6% and this new young Turk who just came out of training is three times as good as him. So something different between the patients and something different between the patients. <clears throat> how many times do you, the cecum is the very beginning of the colon, the end of the colonoscopy exam. <clears throat> well, if you don't complete the exam, you're probably not gonna have the best quality if you only examine half the, exam, half the colon or three quarters of the colon. So we can actually see, and I'll show you a picture of when you're in the cecum. So we can document what's the percentage of the time that you get to the, what's the percentage of the time you get to the cecum. That is, what's the percentage of the time that you complete the exam that you started to do. And you can compare that from doc to doc. <coughs> How fast do you withdraw the scope? you do what they call a lawnmower colonoscopy, like, like when you pull that lawnmower cord and you just pull the scope out? <laughs> or do you spend the time examining the colon and looking at all the nooks and crannies? When, if, if, ever, if any of you have ever seen a colonoscopy screen, if you're looking straight on it, you've got a 180 degree angle of view, <laughs> the scope only sees 175 degrees, actually 145 degrees. So there, there are areas that it's not looking like your peripheral vision is. You're getting the old scopes are 135, these are 147 and a half. So you've still got little spots where you can't see with the scope, but you have the illusion that you're seeing everything. So when we do that exam, you're twisting and turning and you're going into all these little nooks and crannies. That takes a little bit of time. You can't do that in a minute. <coughs> the quality of the bowel preparation, that's under control of the doc. The better the bowel preparation, the better the exam, the higher the quality. That makes perfect sense. Now we're really getting into inside baseball. How often does your doctor tell you to come back? That's been worked out. You already went through that. You're all experts now. You know when you're supposed to come back and when you're not. Believe it or not, docs get these wrong. That's probably a quality issue. And complications. Very, very early in practice, I got a call by one of my friends who's a lawyer. And again, I'm in that one year where I think I'm really great, but I'm really not. And he says, I, I just got, uh, got called by a hospital to defend them because one of the surgeons started doing colonoscopy and he perforated seven of the first nine cases that he did. <laughs> this is in upstate New York in the, rural upstate New York in the late 80s. So complications are a big deal. I told you the incidence of complications, the incidence of bleeding, the incidence of perforation, we can measure that. We can compare them between dots. <clears throat> the adenoma detection rate is pretty simple. It's the number of adenomas detected, uh, detected, the number of patients who have adenomas <laughs> detected divided by the number of total patients who undergo screening. <clears throat> adenoma detection rate is the best colonoscopy quality indicator. It should be more than 25% in men and more than 15% in women. What should be the sequel intubation rate? It should be greater than 90% for all cases, all comers, for whatever reason that we do colonoscopy. And that would be including taking out polyps, examining people for tumors. Sometimes we have obstructing tumors in the left colon and we can't get to the cecum. That would count as an incomplete exam, but it's an incomplete exam for obvious reasons. So that's what I mean by all cases. But when you just take out the screening examinations, people come in, average risk, colon cancer screening, colonoscopy should get to the cecum 97% of the time. These are national numbers. <coughs> That's the cecum over there, right here. This little crow's foot sort of identifies the cecum. Sometimes you can get snookered and be over here and it looks like that. This right here is the valve that goes into the small intestine. So if you can intubate into the small intestine, you know you've been to the signal. I had a colleague in New York who would put the scope in here, go up the left colon, across the transverse colon, 
go around this corner, stop right there, and say you can see the sequel. If you look really closely, what we really want to do is we want to get underneath this lip. Because there are a couple places that cancers can hide out. One is underneath the ileocecal valve. So although this is the cecum, we really want to get down here where this little bit of stool is, wash that out, and look at the valve on this side. Cancers hang out, hang out at the angles, on the inside part of the angles. Can't straighten out the colon there, so I've got to sort of look backwards or sideways. Cancers hang out, hang out again at that flexure and over here. Oh, I just remember this lady that I did whose mother had colon cancer, and I said, you know, you really don't need colonoscopy. She was like 70 years old, and they wanted colonoscopy, wanted colonoscopy. Before these recommendations came out, I said, fine, I'll do a colonoscopy. She had no symptoms, no anemia. <coughs> I don't know why. I have no idea why. But I looked at this area at least eight times. I don't know why I did it. I just had the sense that there was something I wasn't seeing. After going past here seven times, I found her cancer, which was right over here. So it can be there, and you cannot see it because you have this illusion that you're seeing everything, and you're really not. And that's why taking your time to do the exam is important. So the abnormal detection rate is uh, directly related to the withdrawal time of the scope. Uh, the faster you withdraw things, the, the scope, the more things you're going to miss. The slower the withdrawal rate, the more polyps you're going to find. So what's the average withdrawal time? It's actually been studied. Now average means some are higher and some are lower. The average withdrawal time is six minutes, and that doesn't mean that the colonoscopy takes six minutes. That means that in a person who has average risk, who has a perfectly clean, pristine colon, by the time you get from the time from the cecum, which is the very beginning of the colon or the end of the exam, the cecum right there, <coughs> to the rectum in somebody who has a fairly pristine colon, colon prep like that, and who has no polyps, you don't need to do any <coughs> boxes, you don't need to do any washes to clean out the stool, the average time should be six minutes. And that's been shown. Um, Less than that shows that you'll miss things. That's, been, that's standard. Now, that doesn't mean the exam takes six minutes. The exam is we have to get the person in the room, talk to the person, get consent, get the patient sedated. Most exams take a lot longer than six minutes. We, I schedule my colon, like to schedule my colon estimates every 45 minutes. Some people schedule them <coughs> every half hour. Some people schedule them every 15 minutes. You do the arithmetic. Yeah. You can measure the quality of bowel preparation from, from colonoscopist to colonoscopist. We no longer recommend doing your bowel prep the night before the exam only. We recommend splitting the dose. Very, very important. I'm sorry? I'm And you know, it's less. You know, what we do, we use, a, we use a quart of the prep, followed by a, over an hour, followed by a quart of water, and then again in the morning. It's expensive, depending on your copay, it may be 40 to $60. Once every 10 years is $4 a year. <coughs> the importance of the split dose preparation, they actually studied this too, this is a very, very interesting study that just came out a couple of years ago, is that not only does it make the colon cleaner, but it increases your adenoma detection rate, which is the basis for using split dose preparation as a quality indicator. Because you're going to find more polyps when you use this prep versus the other prep. I think that's probably the most important slide I've shown you. <coughs> Questions? We sort of went through this before, but I'm just going to reiterate it again. Um, average risk person every year, every 10 years starting at 50, African Americans at 45, one first degree relative with colon cancer, older than 60, one first degree relative, dad at 75, it's still 10 year interval, it's still beginning at 50 years old. Okay, that, that's something new, that's, that's a habit that's hard, been hard to break here in Wilson. 
<coughs> two first degree relatives with cancers or adenomas. One adenoma, <coughs> one cancer, two cancers, two adenomas. Or one first degree relative younger than 60. It's five years starting at 40. And then, or 10 years younger than the person that had the cancer. So if the person had the cancer, you got a couple people in the family with cancer, their first degree relative, they got their cancer at 45, you're gonna start at 35. <coughs> Ovarian or uterine cancer, younger than 50 in a woman, um, is the big deal. And that uh, needs to be recognized as a risk for colon cancer. <coughs> what that does is that it, inc it reduces your interval if you're an average risk person other than the fact that your sister had ovarian and uterine cancer, it decreases the interval to five years from 10 years between exams, no matter what we find in here. Well, providing we don't find anything that requires you to come back in three years. So if your exam is normal, your sister had ovarian cancer, uterine cancer at 35, you're gonna go every five years. The Lynch syndrome, that's the one with all the other cancers associated with it, the basal cell skin, skin, skin cancer, we're going to begin 10 years younger than the youngest afflicted relative some, or somewhere between 20 and 25 years of age. And then we're going to do a colonoscopy every one to two years. And the reason for that is that these cancers in Lynch syndrome in the colon don't start as polyps. They start as cancers and they grow really fast. Where, they, where the polyps may take three to five years to degrade into a, into a colon cancer, these things can grow into a colon cancer in 12 to 18 months, 24 months. Yes? I have been told by a nurse that at the age of 80, doctors don't like to do colonoscopies anymore. Is that true or not? And what's the reason for that? I don't know. That's why they, I was asking you. Most of my, most of my 80 year old people can't hear me, so I've spent a lot of time on it. That's a very, very, very good question. When should you stop colonoscopy? And I guess it depends upon your perspective. <clears throat> if you're a politician in Washington, if you're an insurance executive, if you're a doctor, if you're a patient. What our societies recommend is that age is a factor, but it's not the only factor. If you are healthy and you have five to ten years of life on the horizon, that there's nothing that looks like it's going to do you in in five years, you're on dialysis, you got really bad heart disease, you got congestive heart failure, you're in and out of the hospital, screen colonoscopy is not going to help you. And on the other hand, if you're 90 years old and you don't take any medicines, you're one of those survival of the fittest people, which means you're gonna, you, you, you've got a good set of genes. And if you don't have any diseases, you're just sort of like the lucky ones. So that person could elect for screening at 90 years of age. I have done two people over 90, both extremely healthy, found cancers in both of them. One was 91, lived to 95. The other one was 94, lived to 99. We took the cancers out. They went through surgery. They went home in a week. So everything has to, medicine has to be individualized when you're making these kinds of decisions. That's really, really important. And as much as the government would like to pigeonhole things and say we're gonna stop paying for exams at 75, and now they're gonna tell you that you can't have them even if you wanna pay for them yourself, um, that's probably not the best medicine, in my opinion. The individual medicine is really where we need to be. Everybody needs to be treated individually, because everybody's different, and the situations are different. <coughs> now, let's say we take out an adenoma, one or two adenomas, less than a centimeter. Again, screening intervals, five to 10 years. Three to 10 adenomas or an adenoma greater than a centimeter or a villous adenoma of any size, the interval is three years. Now, if that next, next exam has got nothing, then you go into the five years plan. You know, you're never gonna be back in the 10 year plan. So we do, we do your exam, you have a one and a half centimeter villous adenoma, we take it out, it's not cancer, you come back in three years, that exam's normal, next exam is five years. We've got recommendations back there for you for that. If you have more than 10 adenomas, and we find um, found a couple of people, I found a couple of people here at Wilson with 10 to, 10 to 20 adenomas. Intervals three years, providing we got them all out. If we didn't think we got them all out, it may be a year. Large sessile, sessile meaning that it's not on a stalk, it's sort of growing into the wall of the colon. Um, 
Now, I'll take these things out. Um, I learned after being here for a year that a lot of these people in Wilson go to surgery to have sex through the colon canal. Um, most of these things, if they don't extend across two folds, can really be cut out. Um, and some of the things that are being done now, where we're really cutting out even tumors, I'm not doing it, but it's being done elsewhere, we're taking the entire afternoon to cut out a tumor, a cancer, not a polyp, a cancer. Um, we can cut these things out if you're a little bit fastidious, take your time, uh, and you can get it out. You can save somebody uh, surgery, anesthesia time, risk of surgery. Risk of surgery, risk of death in surgery if you're over 65 is 5%. Five out of 100 people will die during surgery for one apparent reason, mostly cardiac reasons. <clears throat> so that person may come back in two, three, four, five, two, three, six months, and that happens occasionally. We've probably done that, what, three times? Three times a year, three, four times a year. And it's not because your doctor didn't, couldn't get it out. It's because he's smart enough to say, stop, that's enough. I've applied enough heat to the wall. I don't want to perforate the colon. We'll let everything heal, come back, and take a look at it at a later date. <clears throat> now, the other indicator for quality in colonoscopy is the perforation rate. Perforation rate is about 1 in 1,500 to 1 in 1,700. That's all comers, even those guys that are doing colonoscopy who are not trained. <clears throat> now, the perforations can arise from just inserting the scope, and we don't really push that scope in. We sort of twist it a little bit, and actually the, the technique is to telescope the colon over the scope rather than push the scope in. So the technique is to sort of sort of twist and withdraw, and by doing that, you can accordion the, the colon over the scope. So I can make this three-foot colon into a two-foot colon. It's a shorter exam, less scope insertion, better exam. But we can insert, uh, we can have a perforation during insertion. A lot of times, uh, probably in women with pelvic adhesions, um, we can inflate too much air. We, like I said, we have to expand the colon so we can see. Sometimes you can overinflate and it's colon ruptures. And during removal of polyps, we can apply heat that can result in a delayed perforation. We, we've applied so much heat to the wall of the colon that we've sort of melted it, but not really yet burned a hole through it. And as the days go by, that could result in a, in a free perforation, which would require you to come back have, and have surgery. Or during the removal of a polyp where you grab too much of the wall of the colon, you can perforate it there. That's one of the reasons why these large sessile polyps we may not want to take out all at one time. <clears throat> now what we've learned is that if we can avoid using electricity, which we used to do, I was trained to use electricity to take out all polyps because the boss said it would burn any cells around the outside of the polyp. Well, it turns out that that's not really true. And we can take out small polyps without heat, without using cautery. We can use biopsy forceps, which are, when you open them up, they're nine millimeters. So we can take out polyps about five millimeters in size, get margins. Just with the biopsy forceps, we're just picking out the lining of the colon. We're not picking out a, through the wall. You can't get through the wall with biopsy forceps unless you poke it through the wall. <clears throat> but I can safely take out these polyps and get everything and not have to apply any heat. Reduces my perforation risk. Not only can I take out small polyps with a biopsy forceps that's not hooked up to heat, um, but I can also use a snare, a little wire loop, where I can actually snare it around the polyp and then close it and it sort of cuts like a guillotine. And I can do that without electricity for polyps five to 10 millimeters, maybe even a little bit bigger than that. Safely get the polyps out, not leave anything behind and not increase your risk of cancer, but reducing your risk of perforation. <clears throat> a lot of the times what I'll do when I get to a big polyp is I'll inject underneath the polyp because I, if I can raise up just the surface of the colon, I can raise it up enough where I can just sort of chop everything off and get out a bigger piece at one time, either with or without cautery. So I'll inject a solution of uh, adrenaline and, and, and saline, raise the, raise the polyp up high enough so that I can see it. Some of these flat polyps are hard to see. The flat polyps are really the big deal right now. Uh, they're called flat adenomas, and they may be a little bit more aggressive. And the next time I give this talk, I'll probably be talking about flat adenomas. But you can't really grab them with anything. They're often bigger than the biopsy forceps, and you got to get underneath it inject some water or some saline and just push it up so that you can take it off. They're also hard to find, which is why you should go slow. Um, and then removing polyps in pieces. Now, when I trained, we used to have this, uh, uh, we'll get to that in a second. Um, uh, the most common complication of removing polyps, as I said before, is, is bleeding, usually not when we take it out, but um, as the 
area heals. Uh, sometimes there can be bleeding, sometimes the bleeding can be significant. In the old days, we used to get everybody, we used to rush them, get them repaired, have them drink two gallons of this stuff, flush out the colon, and go up there with the scope and cauterize the bleeding area. You almost never need to do that. Bleeding usually stops on its own. Um, depending upon the age and the other and the other illnesses of the patient, they may need to spend a night or two in the hospital just to make sure that the bleeding stops. Um, and usually nothing needs to be done. No operation, no further colonoscopy. Uh, you know, if you're on your fifth unit of blood, then we need to go in there with the scope and do something. <coughs> but most bleeding after polypectomy um, stops on its own, and usually the patients that get admitted are the older patients who may have some underlying cardiac disease and really can't afford to be losing blood at home without us going in. <coughs> when I was training, we had this thing called a hot biopsy, which is a biopsy forceps that was hooked up to electricity so that you could burn everything around the colon in one big grab. <coughs> That's really associated with the highest risk of bleeding, is using the hot biopsy forceps. And for the last five years, we've recommended not doing that. And all of those, all of those uh, bleeding episodes are usually three to four days after the polyps were removed. And we use the hot biopsy forceps to remove small polyps that we now have shown that you don't need to use electricity for. So there's no reason to do this, other than habit. But the science isn't there. All right, this is my last slide. slide. Um, there are two screening tests that have been shown to unequivocally prolong life. One of them is pap smears, and the other is colonoscopy. You men don't need pap smears. <laughs> Imagine what the world would be like if men had to go through pap smears. <laughs> This is really important. Breast, breast cancer, I know it's a, it's a big deal. Breast cancer screening finds cancers, but it never has been shown to prolong life. All the other cancer screening that we do has never been shown to increase life expectancy. Pap smears do. Colonoscopy does. 